Batman has appeared in over 8,000 comic book issues, and that's not even counting all of the Elseworld multiverse stuff. He's fought the Joker, he's joined the Justice League, he's mastered all fighting forms, he's gone up against gods, he's gone through unimaginable grief, like a lot, like maybe too much, he's turned into a baby, and so this begs the question, what the hell even happens in Batman? How do we go from a Batman who's fighting giant fruit thrown at him by an alien and chasing people on roller skates, to a Batman who's taking down trafficking rings in the dead of night? How do we go from a man who would kill his enemies like it was nothing, to a man who's vowed never to use a gun? So that's what we're doing today. Alright, let's go. Batman's first ever story in 1939 was just six pages long. It's a classic murder mystery, and as soon as the murderer tries to get away, Batman decks him in the face, sending him to a miserable death at the bottom of an acid tank. Now does Batman show any remorse? Does he feel the slightest bit bad for this guy he's just incinerated? No, he says fuck him, and disappears off into the night. The funny thing about this first issue is that we aren't told who Batman is until the very end. Bruce Wayne appears as this side character, this boring socialite who sits around smoking pipes with Commissioner Gordon. But as the story goes on, he starts to act a bit weird, he's always disappearing. And then at the end you're like, ah, but I get, I get it now. Over the next few issues we get to learn more about Bruce, mainly his origin story in which his parents are killed by a mugger, triggering his transformation into the character we all know today. He also has a fiancée, Julie, a wealthy actress who has no idea about her partner's secret identity. When Julie is kidnapped by the evil mad monk, Batman pulls up on him while he's sleeping and shoots him in cold blood. It's not long before we're introduced to Batman's trusty sidekick, Dick Grayson aka Robin. After his parents are killed by a local mobster, Bruce takes him under his wing and trains him, not just in terms of fighting but also criminology, detective skills. Dick proves himself when he avenges his parents and becomes Batman's full-time crime-fighting partner. Now despite these stories being very of their time and thus being unintentionally hilarious, it's kinda nice just seeing this dynamic between Batman and Robin. You know, you have this grief-stricken man who misses the innocence of his childhood, and suddenly he gets this whimsical kid who keeps him on track and makes sure he doesn't lose who he is. Funnily enough, it's after Robin's introduction that Batman stops using guns and killing his enemies. Eventually Batman and Robin are introduced to such iconic foes as the Penguin, Catwoman, and of course the Joker. Right from his first appearance, the Joker's injecting people with venom that will force them to smile as they take their last breaths. He injects them in advance, so his victims will go utterly insane with anxiety before they actually die. He then impersonates a police officer in the creepiest way imaginable, tries to burn both Batman and Robin alive, and even when he's caught, he doesn't really care because he knows he's going to get out anyways. Joker's first issue nails the character, because it's a perfect example of his organised chaos. A good joke is unpredictable. The setup is there, but no one can guess the punchline until it's too late, making Joker the perfect rival of a man who's so rational and calculating. Having fought crime for quite a while now, Batman cements a relationship with the police, transitioning from a vigilante to an honorary member of the Gotham Police Department. The iconic Bat Signal is born, and Batman and Commissioner Gordon start working closely together, helping each other foil the Joker's plans. This brings them closer together as detectives, and also friends, kind of. Batman and Robin continue to fight their fair share of criminals, along with guys like Two-Face and Scarecrow. Although unlike the Scarecrow we're all used to, this first version of Scarecrow is just a guy in a Scarecrow costume, who gets defeated when Robin jumps on a seesaw and it hits him in the ass. By this point Bruce and Julie have broken up, and Bruce starts dating Linda, who's honestly just Julie with a different haircut. However, their relationship is short-lived due to a love triangle with Catwoman. You see, Catwoman has fallen in love with Bruce Wayne, who she has no idea is Batman. She says that if she ever got a chance with Bruce, she'd give up on crime and completely reform. And hey, this is great! Bruce can finally put an end to Catwoman if he just takes her out to dinner a couple times. He does just that, it's going really well, and Catwoman prepares to leave her old life behind. Of course, Bruce needs to explain to Linda why he's dating this other woman, and so he explains, he's like, look, I'm doing this thing for Batman, I'm only dating her so she'll give up on crime and blah blah blah. However, he's not talking to Linda here, but actually Catwoman in a Linda mask, because why not? And now having heard their relationship is fake, Catwoman goes back to crime. Bruce and Linda break up anyway, and Bruce goes looking for romance elsewhere. If there's one thing I love about these original comics, it's how you get get to see the slow birth of everything. You get to watch as Batman's secret underground hangar becomes the Batcave, or there's the invention of the Batplane, or just seeing these characters get introduced for the first time. Speaking of which, Batman and Robin get a knock at the door, and some random guy by the name of Alfred shows up. Now while this version of Alfred wasn't around when Bruce was growing up, he still has a connection to the Wayne family in that his dad was a butler for Bruce's dad. Bruce and Dick try and hide their identities at first, although Alfred soon figures it out anyways. Alfred becomes a key part of Batman and Robin's 
adventures, not only helping them at home, but also helping them solve mysteries and fight crime. Another thing I appreciate about these comics is the sense of closure. By now, we're used to comic characters going on and on, their development frozen by an undying obsession with the status quo. But thanks to the DC multiverse and multiple versions of Batman existing, this first Batman actually gets an ending. First, he comes face to face with Joe Chill, the man who killed his parents. And although Chill is killed shortly after, it does allow Bruce to finally close the case of his parents' murder. Also, some of Batman's villains are permanently redeemed. Two-Face's scars are repaired, and he gets to return to his old life as an attorney. Although he's haunted by his criminal actions, Batman helps him get through it, and he gets a happy ending with his wife. Catwoman really does give up on crime, and reveals her identity to Batman and Robin. She makes up for her past behaviour when she saves the life of her brother, stopping him from taking the same path towards crime. Bruce later develops an actual relationship with Catwoman, revealing his true feelings for her. He and Selina eventually marry, and the two have a daughter, Helena. And so, Bruce puts some distance between him and Batman to instead focus on family life. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, however, as Selina's past catches up to her, and she is confronted by a former henchman. Bruce tries to save her, but in doing so, a stray bullet is fired, and fatally wounds Selina. She dies in Bruce's arms, provoking him to give up Batman completely, leaving the crime-fighting duties to a now much older Robin. In the wake of her mother's death, Helena is inspired by her parents' legacy, and becomes the vigilante huntress. She joins Robin in protecting Gotham, while Bruce takes Gordon's place as commissioner. Eventually, Bruce's story comes to an end, not with a grand battle against his oldest foes, not by saving the world, but instead his story comes full circle, in a struggle with a common criminal. You see, there's this guy called Bill Jensen, who blames Commissioner Wayne for his false imprisonment. Upon getting out of prison, he acquires immense power from a sorcerer, I guess he can just do that, and announces his revenge to the people of Gotham. And so, Bruce puts on the costume one last time, and sets off to bring Jensen to justice. Somehow Jensen overpowers all other superheroes in the vicinity, leaving Batman as the last man standing. Batman manages to defeat Jensen, but at a cost, and the two are taken out in the resulting explosion. In death, Bruce's identity is revealed to the world, and he is mourned by his friends, family, and the city he once swore to protect. His legacy lives on in his daughter Huntress, and the man who was like a son to him, Robin. Okay, if you didn't know already, you've probably figured it out by now. There are multiple versions of Batman, the first one being the Batman of Earth 2. Typically, there's an in-universe explanation, be it the destruction of the multiverse, or timeline changes, or in the case of Earth 1 Batman, they just don't say shit. This can be very frustrating at first, because all of a sudden this new guy comes along and it's like, great, now the last 30 years of comics are completely irrelevant and we've got to start again. I don't think this is really the case though. The thing about Batman is that there's so many different aspects and layers to his character, and he's adapted himself to so many different eras that they can't all exist in one version. It's great because these different takes on Batman can coexist, and while they are technically different people, his story continues on spiritually with each new version. Earth-1 Batman first appeared in the 1950s, and he's more or less the same as the last guy. His parents are shot dead, he takes Robin under his wing, Alfred shows up, albeit with a different surname. Despite this, there are some small differences, not only in terms of his origin, but also his general behaviour. While the previous Batman would only team up with other heroes on occasion, this Batman is far more of a team player. Not only is he a founding member of the Justice League, but he's also best buds with Superman. Well, I say that, but despite their friendship being generally wholesome, there are an alarming number of fights between them. Whether it's Superman getting mind controlled, or Batman getting mind controlled, or Batman getting mind controlled again, or the Justice League getting mind controlled, or the time that Superman joined the Mafia and in order to prove his allegiance to him he has to brutally murder both him and Batman's loved ones before their eyes. No Superman, please don't kill them! Shut up Batman! And then he fucking burns them alive. Of course it's revealed that they didn't die, and they were actually swapped out for these conveniently placed wax figures. This era of comics is dumb and brilliant and very reflective of the time. By now, the comic industry is being censored more, and so all of the horror elements of the 40s disappear in favour of the more light-hearted, weird shit. And Batman's meeting his alien counterpart from the planet Zurinar and helping him fight off evil robots with his own superpowers, and yeah, it's amazing. Perhaps the biggest victim of this era is the Batmobile. Batman can't quite decide what to do with it, he's either changing it to a firemobile, or it's being constantly taken apart and destroyed and repaired, or it's coming alive only to be destroyed again and then replaced by the fucking whirly bat. Also, there's one issue where Alfred dies. He gets crushed to death by a rock in what's actually a proper valiant sacrifice to save his loved ones, only for it to be revealed that he didn't actually die and instead got turned into this thing. Over time, we're introduced to new characters, such as Kathy Kane, the first Batwoman, and her niece Betty as Batgirl. Also joining the Batman family is Ace the Bat-Hound. Ace is an absolute weapon. He takes bullets for Batman and Robin, but even that doesn't stop him. He becomes giant, he'll show up at the last minute to save everyone. He's just the best, and it's a shame we don't get to see a lot of him later down the line. 
Last but not least, we have Batmite, a magical being from the fifth dimension who's more of a romantic than anything else. Not only does he fall in love with Batwoman, but he also becomes Batgirl's wingman. You see, Batgirl has a crush on Robin, but he doesn't appear to be interested. And so Batmite comes up with a plan. The plan in question being to make Batgirl look so awesome that Robin can't possibly ignore her anymore. And you know what? It works. Earth-1 Batman also saw the introduction of some classic enemies, such as Poison Ivy and the Riddler. Mr. Freeze also shows up, only he's not called Mr. Freeze yet. Instead, Mr. Zero. Eventually, both Batwoman and Batgirl retire from crime fighting and are succeeded by the second Batgirl, the alter ego of Commissioner Gordon's daughter, Barbara. Barbara soon proves herself as a member of the Batman family, using her iconic feminine curiosity and feminine intuition to defeat bad guys, and she becomes a close ally of Batman and Robin. Now, as much as I love this era, it was clear that it had strayed far from the original point of the character. A big part of Batman is death. Not because it's dark and edgy, but because to Batman, death has meaning. It's what started him on his journey, him overcoming his fear of death and becoming a symbol of fear in his own right. These criminals, these killers, they're avatars of death, and him triumphing over that is so important to the character and what he represents. But by this point, thanks to censorship and the influence of the Adam West show, the aspect of death and fear was almost gone entirely. The Joker stopped killing people and is just doing fun pranks, pretty much. It's great, but it's all getting a bit stale, and it's time for Batman to return to his roots. As we start to approach the 70s, the tone of the books gets a bit darker. Censorship starts to slip, and there's more of an inclusion of domestic violence, mental breakdowns, and the fights feel more impactful and brutal. Eventually, it's time for Dick Grayson to graduate high school and move on to university, leaving both Bruce and Alfred genuinely upset. With this, Bruce leaves the Batcave behind, and moves his base of operations to a penthouse in the middle of Gotham. Now, Dick's not gone forever, but this is the final push into the darker direction, and Batman fights crime alone as a symbol of fear once again. Colourful, wacky stories are traded in for dark, borderline horror plots. Take Man-Bat, for example, a zoologist who uses science to enhance his own senses, only to turn himself into a messed-up human-bat hybrid. Or the Reaper, who, while he does look a bit stupid, turns out to be a survivor of a concentration camp who witnessed his whole family die. Upon learning this, Batman draws a painful comparison to himself, and while he tries to save the Reaper from taking the wrong path, he ultimately fails and the story ends in tragedy. At the very least, the Batmobile gets a break, with Bruce switching it out for just a regular-ass car. At last, it's time for Batman to meet one of his most important adversaries. Now, I'm in the middle of a minefield here, because there is no definitive way to pronounce his name, whether it's Raz al Ghul, or Raish al Ghul, or fucking Rachel. Either way, I'm getting absolutely slaughtered by Batman fans and about 300 million Arabic speakers. But the thing is, Watch Mojo pronounced it Raish in one of their videos. And because I hate Watch Mojo with all of my heart, I'm gonna go with Raz, just to spite them. Now, if Joker is the Batman's opposite, Ross is a mirror. He's got a similar goal, you know, he's doing what he thinks is right for the world. He's been through his own trauma and trained himself to his physical and psychological peak. However, his methods are quite different in that he likes a bit of mass genocide and he's what Bruce could become if he didn't have his code. It's probably worth pointing out that Ross is basically immortal, having lived hundreds of years thanks to the Lazarus Pit, a magical fountain of youth which Ross uses to extend his life and heal his injuries. Using common sense, he looked up all of Bruce Wayne's purchases and saw a bunch of suspiciously Batman-like equipment on the list. However, Ross has no intention of exposing him. He's got other plans. It turns out that his daughter, Talia, is in love with Batman, and Roz is testing whether Batman would make a good son-in-law, whether he's worthy or not of becoming a successor. Batman disapproves, what with them being on the opposite ends of the crime-fighting spectrum, resulting in a lifelong conflict between the two. Regardless, Bruce finds out that he does actually have feelings for Talia, and he allows her to get away whenever he captures her father. As the series goes on, Batman's classic villains start popping up more and more, and we get the first appearance of Arkham Asylum, the place that locks up Batman's insane foes when he's done with them. Joker returns, actually killing this time, once again proving why he's Batman's greatest foil. He's just pure chaos, he's always one step ahead of everyone, and perfectly contrasts how Batman operates. Then we have the Riddler, who is the perfect rival for the detective side of Batman. They're both ridiculously smart, except Batman uses his brain for good, Riddler uses his to make a joke about corn. In a lot of his schemes, Riddler could just get away with it if he didn't give Batman all these clues. But he's a narcissist, he's always dressing up and making sure people know it's him. Two-Face shows up as a reminder of what could happen to Batman if he was corrupted by his quest for justice. Batman is calculating, Two-Face leaves things up for chance. Then we have Scarecrow, who's actually kind of cool now and not just some guy in a Scarecrow costume. Both Scarecrow and Batman are symbols for fear, only Scarecrow's far more sadistic and uses his methods for evil. All of these guys, they're all similar to Batman in some way, they're all some extreme, perverted version of him, and they all make sense to be part of his rogues gallery. Except, crazy quilt. 
By now, the concept of the multiverse is very much established, allowing the Batman of this Earth to cross over with the world of his predecessor. One night, while investigating the case of a missing person, Batman and Robin are shocked when they come across a person claiming to be Bruce's daughter. You see, Helena from Earth 2 has used a trans-dimensional device owned by her version of the Justice Society, and she's come to Earth 1 to ask this Batman advice on how to be a hero. A few years later, we get more crossovers, in which Batman gets sent to Earth 2 on multiple occasions. In one of them, he finds his own grave and freaks the fuck out, he then works with the much older Robin to get him home to the right Earth. Another thing that's different about this Batman is the emphasis on romance. Batman's always had love triangles and people chasing after him to ridiculous degrees, but here it seems to actually affect them. He tries to have a relationship with Catwoman, but it doesn't work out as he feels like he can't trust her. Then he meets Silver St. Cloud and the two get along really well. Even Alfred's thinking, hey, maybe she's the one for Master Bruce, but again it doesn't work out. And so, when Talia asks to stay at the Batcave, Bruce, being vulnerable from his recent breakups, says yes. He starts a relationship with the daughter of the demon, driving a wedge between him and Robin, causing Catwoman to get super jealous only for their relationship to end soon afterwards. Bruce and Talia continue to be on and off, but they always seem to separate from each other in the end. That's not even mentioning Vicky Vale, a photographer who he previously had a thing with in the 50s, only for her to return years later, reigniting their relationship. Surprisingly, it doesn't end well. At the end of the day, Batman is tired and heartbroken and it's all really getting to him. He gives up on the penthouse and goes back to Wayne Manor. He's struggling to balance his two lives and so he steps down as CEO of his company, passing on the position to his second in command, Lucius Fox. And poor Lucius. You think the Batmobile has it hard, but this guy's on a whole other level of abuse. Not only does he have a stressful work life, but he also gets kidnapped by the Mad Hatter, the Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan to name a few. And speaking of the Batmobile, all of a sudden this fucking prick decides to blow it up. Except it's a car, so it can't move or or scream for help. It can only watch as this sick fuck murders it in cold blood. Commissioner Gordon's also going through it, having to deal with his new assistant, Harvey Bullock. Bullock is a complete nother, who pranks Gordon in the office, causing him to have a heart attack and be sent into a coma. Bullock eventually has somewhat of a redemption arc, but yeah, not exactly the best start. To top all of this pain and suffering off, Kathy Kane, the original Batwoman, is murdered by the League of Assassins, with Bruce finding her body clutching to her costume. By this point, Batman's quite far gone. This grief-stricken man needs a whimsical kid to keep him on track. However, Dick Grayson's all grown up by now, and is much more involved as the leader of the Teen Titans. So let's get a new one. Jason Todd's origin story is virtually identical to Dick Grayson's. It doesn't really matter that these stories are so similar though, because how they happen isn't important. It's Bruce's reaction to them. When Dick's parents were killed, Bruce didn't hesitate. Here's your costume, mate. Now swear in the blood of your parents that you'll be my child soldier until you die. But with Jason, he's far more reluctant. Jason even uses the similar origin stories as an argument, saying, hey, I'm literally the same as the last Robin and you were fine to let that happen. What's so different about me? Perhaps he believes he's too far gone and he should only work solo. Perhaps he's learned not to endanger children for his own benefit. Whatever it is, Bruce shuts Jason down. It's only once Jason proves himself time and time again and dyes his hair black that Bruce finally gives in. He thinks, well, you're going to do this whether I stop you or not. I might as well train you so you don't die. With Dick's blessing, Jason becomes the new Robin, with Dick then moving on from the mantle to create an identity he can make entirely his own. By now, we're in the 80s, and this Batman story is coming to a close. It's a time for reflection and also closure. Bruce throws in one last romance for the road, this time with one of his enemies, Nocturna. But then she dies and he gets with Catwoman again. In the series 400th issue, Batman faces his greatest challenge yet. Ross al Ghul breaks out pretty much every villain in both Arkham Asylum and Gotham's prison. The Joker, the Riddler, Penguin, Poison Ivy, Scarecrow, Killer Croc, Two-Face, Clayface, the Mad Hatter, Black Mask, fucking Crazy Quilt. Ross brings them all together, uniting them in the name of one common goal, to screw over Batman. This is especially bad, as Ross knows Bruce's identity, plus the location of his house and therefore the Batcave. He also kidnaps Bruce's loved ones, both Alfred and his daughter Julia, along with Vicky Vale and Bullock, I guess. He also arranges a complete takeover of Gotham PD, holding Gordon hostage. However, Batman is not without his allies. He is surprised by both Selina and Talia, who've come to help him in his time of need. Together, Bruce, Jason, Selina and Talia take the villains head on, and after a lengthy number of battles, manage to defeat them. Once everyone is safe, it's time for Bruce to face Ross himself. The fight is tough, brutal, but as always, Bruce comes out on top. Ross is buried under his exploding base, while Bruce and his allies narrowly escape. 
In the aftermath of the battle, everyone gathers in the Batcave to celebrate. While everyone else parties, Bruce goes off alone. There's no time for parties because his battle is not yet finished and it never will be. God, what a downer. They baked you a cake, man. Unfortunately, Bruce doesn't get to have any more adventures. Not this Bruce, at least. During the Crisis on Infinite Earths, a vast and uncaring wall of antimatter makes its way across the multiverse, killing trillions of people like it's nothing. Each world's heroes do what they can to defend their homes, but they're all consumed by the antimatter. All the surviving heroes band together to save all of existence. This includes the original Dick Grayson and Helena from Earth 2, who do what they can in the battles that against the evil anti-monitor. It ends up a victory for the heroes, but a very costly one. During one of the battles, Helena is brutally crushed by a collapsing building. Dick attempts to save her, but it's no use, and he is soon vaporised by the oncoming attackers. At the end of the event, the multiverse is no more, and the remaining universes have merged into one single Earth. While Bruce and Jason survive the crisis, their histories are rewritten, transforming them, and everyone else in existence, into different people with different pasts. And so it's time for a new Batman. Again. Straight out the gate we get Year One, which not only explores Bruce's youth and how he becomes Batman, but it also focuses on Gordon. His struggle in a corrupt police department, his early relationship with Batman, and his affair with his fellow police officer, Sarah, who would later become his wife. Later down the line we get titles like Prey, or The Long Halloween, or Batman and the Monster Men, these fantastic reimaginings of Batman's earlier years as a crime fighter. They're all great, I mean they do kind of contradict each other a bit, but that's just DC canon for you. So yeah, everything happens more or less the same, it's just a bit more streamlined and there are different details. Bar Barbara becomes Batgirl, Dick becomes Nightwing, and Jason takes over as Robin. You can basically treat them as the same characters when you're reading it all through, it's just that their origins are a bit fluid. Around 20 issues into the new Batman series, we get a beautiful issue in which Batman saves a man from jumping off a bridge, giving him a second chance at life. Later in the same story, Batman takes time out of his day to sit down with a couple homeless kids. He listens to their story of how they ended up on the street, and takes custody of them in his own home, letting them stay with him until he finds their relatives. Take note of this moment, because it's going to be the last time Bruce is happy in a long, long while. Shortly after, Bruce is kidnapped and drugged by the religious cultist Joseph Blackfire. While under Blackfire's influence, Bruce is manipulated into breaking his no-kill rule, and while he's eventually rescued by Jason and Blackfire is defeated, Bruce still has to live with what he did. Then Batman fights the greatest villain of all time, the murderous KG Beast. You see, he's an assassin for the KGB, and he's a beast. In the end, Batman has to make the final decision to let the beast die, trapping him in a chamber to waste away alone. Then, to make matters worse, the Joker escapes from Arkham and travels to the home of Commissioner Gordon. Without warning, he shoots Barbara at point blank, paralysing her below the waist, before torturing Gordon in an amusement park. It's all pretty messed up to say the least. Then we get the famous set of panels in which Batman reaches out to the Joker, trying to relate to him and offering him a way out. It's only when the Joker declines the offer as usual that Batman grabs him, and then you're like, Oh, did he kill him? Did he finally kill the Joker? Spoiler alert, he uh, doesn't kill him because the Joker escapes two seconds later. Joker discovers a woman called Sheila Haywood, who just so happens to be Jason's birth mother who abandoned him at a young age. She ended up in Ethiopia, embezzling medical supplies for a refugee camp, and so naturally the Joker uses this to blackmail her. When Jason learns of his long lost mother, he is thrilled to meet her, and desperate to free her from the Joker's grasp. Bruce begs Jason not to go in alone, and instead wait until they're properly prepared. But you know, it's his mother, so he goes in alone anyway. Jason puts up a fair fight, only to be betrayed by his own mother. You see, if Jason stops the Joker, Sheila's embezzling would be uncovered in the process, and so she has no choice but to go against her own child. With this, Joker gets the upper hand, and savagely beats Jason to an inch of his life. Sheila's betrayal is in vain anyway, as the Joker double crosses her and leaves her to die with Jason as well. Trapped in a room rigged to explode, Jason attempts to save his mother, even despite all she's done to him. Sadly, his efforts aren't enough, and Bruce arrives too late to save them. Bruce is devastated to find Jason's body lying among the wreckage, in a moment he would later cite as his greatest failure. Perhaps the saddest thing about Jason's death is that barely anyone shows up to his funeral. What with him being an orphan and all, he barely had any loved ones to celebrate his short life. Despite Jason's problems, Bruce was genuinely proud of him. He knew that he was a good kid and only wanted the best for him. After Jason's death, Bruce swears that he will never have another sidekick again. Before he can confront the Joker, however, Bruce is informed that the Joker has become the international ambassador of Iran, giving him full diplomatic immunity. If Batman tries anything against him, major political chaos will break out all across the world. And so Bruce, taking his patience to a whole new level, reaches out to the Joker one more time and tries to make peace. The Joker, of course, declines the offer. It's only when Joker attempts to gas the UN that Bruce has an opportunity to stop him, and even with everything the Joker has done, Batman still saves his life. The Joker goes missing after the fight, and Bruce is once again left without closure. 
During his mourning period, Bruce is tired and isolated, becoming far more brutal when it comes to fighting crime. While he still appreciates Alfred's care, it's clear that Jason's death has driven a wedge between them. A few issues later, Bruce takes on the case of a missing child. It's here we get a rather touching moment, in which Gordon asks why he's so driven by this particular case. Bruce doesn't respond, instead just looking at a picture of Jason, before disappearing off into the night. Bruce won't be alone for much longer, as no more than four issues later, a young lad by the name of Tim Drake shows up. Having met Dick Grayson during his days as a circus performer and memorising all of his moves, Tim was able to figure out who Robin was, and as a result, Batman as well. Not only that, but he's also noticed Batman's violent behaviour in the wake of Jason's death. With all of this knowledge, Tim has realised that Batman needs a Robin to keep him in check, that if Batman is a symbol of fear and darkness, Robin is what keeps that darkness from spreading too far. And so you think Tim would volunteer, that he'd be jumping at the chance to be Batman's newest child soldier, but no. Instead, he confronts Dick, and asks him to go back to being Robin. It's only when Dick refuses, that Tim takes matters into his own hands. While Tim manages to rescue both Bruce and Dick, Bruce is not exactly happy with this new Robin. In fact, it takes a whole issue for Tim to convince him, along with encouragement from both Alfred and Dick, and even then, he's still not too keen on it. Regardless, Bruce uses his failure with Jason to make sure he doesn't make the same mistake. He will only let Tim join his side once he is 100% trained and capable of defending himself, and only then will Batman have a new Robin. As the 80s end and the 90s begin, we get a bunch of cool stories. We get Arkham Asylum, this beautifully fucked up story exploring the psychology of Batman's villains. And it's like if gothic horror had a baby with LSD, and I don't know what's happening half the time, but I love it. It's then followed up by stories like Batman Gothic, Batman Venom, Batman Blades, which are way easier to understand, but just as impactful. While these stories aren't set in the present, they still carry forward the themes of Jason's death, Batman's drive to protect children, and him being pushed further and further into darkness by tragedy. The story Night Cries deals with the cycle of abuse between parent and child, and it has this amazing wee moment between Batman and this little girl. Bruce takes off his mask, removing the symbol of fear to let her know she doesn't need to be scared anymore, and while he may not be ready to take his own advice, it's still nice to see him channeling his grief to help others. By this point, Barbara has bounced back after her encounter with the Joker, although her paralysis means that being a traditional superhero is out of the question. Still, she doesn't let this hold her back, and she instead becomes Oracle, using her detective skills combined with hacking to provide Batman and his allies vital information during their adventures. Also, a new vigilante has popped up by the name of Huntress. This is not Helena Wayne, who by this point technically doesn't exist, but instead Helena Bertinelli, a ruthless crime fighter who has no relation to Bruce. Also, Lucius gets kidnapped by the crime lord Black Mask, once again proving that he can never get a break. Now if you thought the 80s were hard on Batman, the 90s are just never-ending pain, especially with the Nightfall storyline, in which Batman is broken to the point that he can't be Batman anymore. Basically, there's this kid called Jean-Paul, and while his introduction might seem a bit random here, he's going to end up being a pretty big deal. Jean-Paul opens his door one day, to find his dad bleeding out on his doorstep. It turns out that his dad was the latest in a long line of religious assassins, each calling themselves Azrael. Not only that, but his dad had been subconsciously planting a form of mental programming in him since birth, giving him extreme fighting skills. Influenced by a member of his dad's religious order, Jean-Paul becomes the new Azrael. It turns out though that Jean-Paul isn't really a bad kid. He eventually turns his back on the order and uses his abilities to save Batman's life. And so Bruce thinks, okay, Jean-Paul is dangerous, sure, but with the right training he can counteract his brainwashing and he can become an ally instead of a threat. The thing is, Bruce is completely burnt out. He's far too exhausted, both physically and mentally, to train Jean-Paul. By now, Tim's been Robin for a while, and so Bruce gets him to train Jean-Paul instead. The new Azrael proves himself as a force for good, as he helps save Lucius, who has been hypnotised into offing himself. Bruce doesn't get much rest, as he is soon faced with the arrival of Bane. Bane makes a good first impression in that he causes a massive breakout at Arkham, who at this point should really reconsider their security measures. This weakens Bruce, as he uses up all of his energy catching the freed villains, thus giving Bane the perfect opportunity to strike. Aside from the breakout, Bane has also managed to figure out Bruce's identity, having studied him intently, his body language, his equipment, everything. This guy is just as smart as he is strong. Finally, Bane shows up at Wayne Manor to put Bruce in his place. The two share an incredible conversation about their motivations, and how Bane considers Gotham to be the ultimate prize, and how he's going to break Batman for it, and Batman's like, nah, I'm sick of all this shit. And while he does recognise Bane's strength and formidability, he's like, fuck you, I'll take you on anyway. A brutal fight ensues. At the end of it all, Bane declares his victory by snapping Bruce's back in two, and throwing him out on the streets of Gotham. 
While Tim and Alfred fabricate a story to explain why Bruce Wayne is brutally injured at the same time as Batman, Bane seizes his moment and begins to take over Gotham. He tries to recruit various criminals in the Gotham underworld, including Catwoman, although she declines the offer to work for him. Realising that Gotham still needs a Batman, both Bruce and Tim agree that someone should take over for the time being. Tim suggests Nightwing, which would be the obvious choice, but Bruce disagrees, saying that Dick has his own responsibilities and that this isn't his fight. Okay, I guess. So this leaves the only other option. Fucking Jean-Paul. Jean-Paul confidently accepts, and takes Bruce's place as Batman alongside Tim. Jean-Paul's methods are brutal, what with him being an assassin and all, scaring the hell out of Tim. Determined to go beyond Bruce's Batman, he completely redesigns the Batsuit, and uses it to confront Bane. It's a lengthy, yet climactic battle, and Jean-Paul manages to beat Bane. This kinda goes to Jean-Paul's head, and he becomes violent as hell, losing his mind in the middle of battles, and even letting a criminal fall to their death. By this point, Bruce has gone on a lengthy trip around the world, allowing him to heal a lot of his injuries. Having learned of his replacement's behaviour, Bruce confronts Jean-Paul, demanding that he give up the role of Batman. But Jean-Paul, he's not having it. He thinks that he's far more deserving of the title, and refuses to give up control. And so Bruce temporarily returns as Batman, and vows to take back his city. Both Batman clash in a war for Gotham's soul, with Bruce coming out on top. In the end, Bruce goes easy on him, leaving him to go off and start his own life as Azrael. Then we get Zero Hour, which, like Crisis on Infinite Earths, was meant to clean up continuity and make changes to characters' pasts, albeit not so drastically. At the end of the event, there's a new Big Bang which resets the entire universe. After the event, we learn that it wasn't Joe Chill who killed Batman's parents, or at least Batman never figured out who it was, which retcons an earlier story. I do actually like this retcon, that the killer was just this random person who was never caught. But later we learn that it was Joe Chill the whole time, but he was already dead by now so Batman like couldn't go after him. While Bruce may have reclaimed the mantle of Batman, it doesn't remove the toll it's taken on him over the years. Still exhausted and hoping for a proper break, Bruce passes the cowl onto Dick Grayson. During this time, both Dick and Tim get closer together, while Bruce disappears for the next while. When Bruce comes back, Dick isn't exactly happy with the way he's been treated, especially Bruce's original decision to make Sean Paul Batman instead of him. You get this amazing, emotional argument between them, in which Bruce admits that he knew Dick would be a good Batman. He knew he would be loyal, he just didn't know how to ask him. Bruce admits that he got it all wrong, that he left so many things unsaid between them, and their relationship had been strained over the years due to Bruce's inability to be real with his son. Afterwards, Dick returns to his role of Nightwing, and Bruce takes over as Batman once again. Okay, so Bruce is back, for real this time. His time away shows, as he's acknowledging his faults with Tim, and isn't afraid to take other people's advice sometimes. And while Bruce has had his time off, you know he's fresh, he's rejuvenated, Commissioner Gordon is the opposite. He's getting too old for this shit. In fact, the whole police force is going through it, especially Bullock, who gets put in a coma by none other than KG Beast himself. I guess he didn't die after all. Now it's not long before Batman meets his greatest enemy, Ebola. Yes, it turns out that a special strain of Ebola has made its way to Gotham City, leaving Batman, Robin, Nightwing, Catwoman, Huntress, and Azrael to stop it. In the end, Jean-Paul somewhat redeems himself when he delivers the Ebola cure, saving the entire city. Well, at least that's what they think. The Ebola actually mutates, meaning that everyone they thought they just cured is now doubly fucked. Not only that, but we soon find out that the mastermind behind everything is none other than Ra's al Ghul. His plan is to wipe out 90% of the global population, and that way his grandchildren will inherit a new world. The grandchildren, you say? I thought Bruce didn't want to have children with Talia, nor provide an heir for his enemy's empire. Well, it turns out that Ross has found a new son-in-law to be a successor. Bane. Batman chases Ross to Scotland of all places, where he teams up with a bunch of Scottish people to take him down. This issue contains possibly the greatest representation of us Scots in modern media. It's true, we all look like this, all the time. Through the power of teamwork, Batman, Robin, Nightwing, Catwoman, Huntress, and Oracle manage to sabotage Ra's plan, and blow him up for good measure. Bane is also defeated, vaccines are given to everyone, and the city is saved for real this time. It's also probably worth mentioning that by this point, Tim has found love, and is going through his own shit with his girlfriend Ariana. At the same time, he gets closer to one of his vigilante partners, Stephanie, aka the spoiler. Now, the danger of the plague may be over, but Gotham as a whole has been severely weakened, and it's only downhill from here. First, Lucius is shot. Someone just put him out of his misery at this point. Then, as if things weren't bad enough, the city is hit with a devastating earthquake, killing hundreds of thousands of people. Wayne Manor collapses, and both Bruce and Alfred are buried under the Batcave. To top things off, the destruction all across the city has ruptured the gas mains, setting everything on fire. Nightwing, Huntress, and Catwoman all do what they can to help survivors, while Bruce manages to escape the rubble and rescue Alfred. Gordon is also trapped, but Bullock comes to his rescue, once again proving that he's not a total asshole. During the disaster, Batman's villains use the chaos to their advantage, stirring up trouble and killing a bunch of people. 
Also, Tim realises his feelings for Stephanie, and so he does the mature thing of breaking it off with Ariana. Well, he tries to talk to her, only for her to break up with him first, so problem solved I guess. In the aftermath of the earthquake, Bruce gives a speech to Congress, asking them to support Gotham. It's this really powerful speech about how, yes, Gotham is seen as a shithole and it's filled with parasites and demons, but the people of Gotham will always prevail. There will always be saints who rise above the sinners, and these good people deserve some help. Bruce uses his failures as Batman to fuel his speech, really hammering his point home, and the whole city is watching him on live television, and at the end of it all, Congress says, no, you ain't getting shit. In fact, not only did they refuse to help, but they cut Gotham off from the rest of the world, saying it's no longer part of America. Any remaining bridges are destroyed, and the entire city is quarantined from the rest of the country. This leads us to No Man's Land, a 100 issue storyline, if you include all the prologues and side stories. It follows Batman, Batman's friends, and Batman's enemies, as they deal with the utter chaos of a war-torn Gotham City, without any rules or outside help. A whole bunch of stuff happens during this time. All of Gotham's criminals fight for control of various territories. Gordon and the few police officers that are left are overwhelmed, and are forced to work with criminals such as Two-Face to survive. Huntress becomes Batgirl for a bit, then goes back to being Huntress after Batman tells her off, while a new lady by the name of Cassandra takes the mantle. Two-Face betrays the police, Harley Quinn is introduced for the first time, adding to all the chaos, then Lex Luthor shows up, tries to kill Lucius for God's sake, and then the Joker kidnaps all babies in Gotham City. At the end of it all, the government's like, okay fine, Gotham can be part of America again. It's a bittersweet victory though, as Gordon's wife Sarah is killed by the Joker, adding to the already staggering number of traumas in his life. At the very least, Nightwing and Huntress get together for a bit. With this, the 90s are finally over. It was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, but we can now look forward to a new millennium, with stories that might not be as painful for the characters. We get stories like Tower of Babel, in which the Justice League finds Batman's contingency plans to take them all down. After these plans fall into the wrong hands, and the trust of his fellow superheroes is weakened, Batman is voted out of the Justice League. It's a great story which highlights not only Bruce's trust issues and his shame, but also his friendship with Superman. Because at the end of the day, Batman and Superman are friends, and it's the best. Then we get these beautifully told stories like Batman Ego, which explores Bruce's troubled mind and allows him to speak to his Batman persona as a separate entity. Or we have Batman New Gotham, a collection of really cool detective stories which explore the ramifications of No Man's Land, and how Gordon's grief has impacted his police work. Gordon is then shot, and barely pulls through, provoking him to retire from the force completely. Despite him and Batman no longer working together, he still wants the two of them to remain friends, and tells Batman he can stop by whenever he wants. Then we get to Batman Hush. This is often cited as one of Baby's first Batman stories. It deals with everything, it has callbacks to Batman's history, the trauma of his parents' murder and the failures that have haunted him throughout his life, it explores his friendship with Superman, who is once again mind controlled and forced to fight Batman, it explores Bruce's relationship with Selina as they get closer together and learn to trust each other, you have Bruce's moral conflict as to whether or not he's going to kill the Joker, you have Alfred and Gordon and Barbara and Talia and fucking Jason comes back from the dead to haunt Bruce, only for it to be revealed that it was Clayface playing a trick on him. Another thing this story does is introduce the titular character of Hush, a brand new Batman villain. Hush is another mirror for Bruce. They both share the same past, they're both on the same level in terms of intellect and combat training, kinda. They both have dual lives in that they're a rich person by day and a creature of the night by night. Now Hush's plan to take down Batman is kinda ruined in the end when he just gets fucking shot, but fear not, because that's not the last we're gonna be seeing of him. Quite frustratingly however, Bruce and Selina's relationship doesn't work out for the millionth time, and Bruce's chance at love is squandered once more. Now with everyone having dead parents all the time, you kinda forget that Tim's dad, Jack, is very much alive, and Tim's been operating as Robin without his father's knowledge. Eventually the lies build up, and Jack starts getting a bit suspicious. After poking around, Jack finds not only Tim's costume, but his diaries as well, revealing both Bruce and Tim's identities, the Batcave, Alfred, all of it. When Jack confronts everyone at Wayne Manor, no one has any idea what to do. Alfred's like, let's fucking kill him! But realistically, they have no options that work in their favour. Their only real solution is this. Jack will agree not to expose any of them, so long as his son stops putting himself in danger and quits. And so, Tim reluctantly leaves the Batcave, leaving Batman once again without a Robin. Well, that is for about half an issue. You see, Stephanie, you remember Stephanie, you know, Tim's girlfriend, also a vigilante? Well, she thinks that Tim is cheating on her. And so, in an act of jealousy, Stephanie makes herself a Robin costume and asks Batman if she can be his new partner. And Batman's like, yeah, sure. It's going pretty well until she disobeys one of his orders and then he's like, nah, you're fired. Shortly after, Gotham is swamped by this massive gang war, with Black Mask taking everything over with the help of Hush. During this conflict, one of Tim's friends at school is killed, motivating him to become Robin against his father's wishes. 
Initially, Jack is not very pleased, but he eventually expresses how proud he is of Tim and accepts that Tim has a responsibility to the city. Robin's return brings great tragedy. First, Stephanie dies, which would be devastating enough for him, but then his dad Jack is killed by Captain Boomerang, and Tim becomes an orphan just like the Robins before him. Still, Tim keeps going and doesn't crumble due to his grief. Now, despite all this, things are looking a bit too good for Bruce. Don't get me wrong, he still has his problems, but he hasn't been utterly emotionally devastated in a while. So fuck it, let's break him. A mysterious new criminal appears, calling himself the Red Hood, using brutal methods to put dents in Black Mask's operation. Eventually, the Red Hood confronts Batman himself, and they both prove themselves as a match for each other. Then, as the two men come to a standstill in the pouring rain, Red Hood takes off his helmet, and to Bruce's surprise, there stands... Jason Todd. Back from the dead. For real this time. Bruce is understandably distraught, as anyone would be if their greatest failure came back to haunt them. He calls out Jason as a fake, a phantom, but deep down he knows it's the real deal. Jason has come back to right Bruce's wrongs, to cross the lines that Batman won't. He will bring peace to Gotham by finally killing those who threaten it. Now Jason goes through with this plan, and threatens to actually kill the Joker. What follows is a heartfelt discussion about Batman's ethics, and why he chooses not to kill, but it's still not enough to convince Jason. Before Jason can act, however, all three of them are caught in a massive explosion, allowing both the Joker and Jason to escape, and before Batman can do anything about it, he is summoned into another big crossover. Not only does Infinite Crisis continue the theme brought up by Jason, you know, whether or not Batman's gonna cross the line and do what needs to be done, but it also provides an explanation for how Jason returned. After Superboy Prime punched several holes in the fabric of reality, he does that sometimes, trust me, he sent these event-altering ripples all across the timeline. One such change to reality was the resurrection of Jason, who awoke in his grave, unable to remember who he was. He was then taken in by Talia, who threw him in a Lazarus pit, not only restoring his memories and personality, but corrupting those things, making him, for lack of a better word, a massive knob. Now, flash forward to the events of Hush, Jason hears that Hush has a plan to mess with Batman, and he wants to join in. So, that actually was Jason, he just switched out with Clayface at the last minute. With everything that's been going on, Bruce takes another break, doing some soul searching around the world and doing what he can to remove his demons. When he returns to Gotham, he's completely freshened up, energised, and there is no problem he can't solve. Both he and Tim are working great together, with Bruce officially adopting Tim as his son. Two-Face comes back, not that big of a deal, gets resolved after a few issues, Lucius gets kidnapped, I guess some things never change. Perhaps the only real tragic thing that happens is that my favourite supervillain of all time, Mr. KG Beast, is shot in the head, and dies with no loved ones to mourn him. It's gotten to the point where Batman is just so epic now that he and Tim have virtually eliminated all supervillains from Gotham, so much so that Batman has forgotten how to be Bruce Wayne. Bruce takes time to re-establish his reputation as a billionaire playboy, going out to parties and fundraisers and such. However, his holiday is cut short as one of the parties is crashed by Talia and her League of Man-Bat Assassins. Talia drags Bruce away and reveals to him a shocking truth. It turns out that years ago she conceived a child with Bruce and didn't tell him about it, and she's been raising the child in secret ever since. But because she's such a great mother, she'd like her child to finally get a bit of father-son time. And so we meet Damian Wayne, son of the Batman. Of course, being raised by a group of international terrorists will make you a bit of a prick. Damien is quick-tempered, prone to violent outbursts, and tries to fight Tim, proclaiming himself as the one true heir of Batman. The only one who can discipline him is Bruce himself, who tells him to shut his mouth and stop acting like a brat. Damien then disposes of Tim, and tries to take his place as the brand new Robin. Now, despite his violent methods, Damien does genuinely seem to want the role, and believes he's doing the right thing. Bruce obviously isn't pleased with this, but it's still his son, and so he reluctantly gives Damien a trial shift, under the condition that he'll follow all orders and not try and kill anyone while they go and confront Talia. Talia does an Anakin Skywalker in that she wants to bring her family together so they can rule the galaxy, or in this case just the planet. Bruce of course refuses, but Damien is not sure which side to pick. With this, Talia declares war and blows them all up, separating Bruce from Damien, who is taken back to his mother. This brings to an end Batman's rejuvenated streak, and it only gets worse from here. He struggles against new enemies, such as Batbane and Batdevil, getting his ass beat over and over again. He finds new love with the model Jezebel Jet, only for her to be a double agent for the criminal organisation Black Glove. Then it all goes to shit when Ra's al Ghul returns in a decaying form, and tries to steal Damien's body to survive. Obviously objecting to this, Damien escapes to the Batcave to ask for his dad's help, and the Bat family work together to defeat Ra's. It turns out, however, that Ross doesn't need Damien's body, and instead uses the body of one of his other relatives instead. This is an incredible oversimplification, but with this, Ross is more powerful than ever, leading to a final fight between him and Batman. Damien wishes to fight alongside his father, but Talia won't let him, knocking him out and taking him to safety. In the end, Ross is defeated as always, and everyone walks away happy. 
One thing I love about this era of Batman is how it reintroduced concepts from way back in the Silver Age. You get Batman teaming up with all of the Batman inspired heroes from the 50s. You get the Batman of Zurin R, although instead of being an actual alien, he's reimagined as this alternate personality in Bruce's mind, a backup in case things go wrong. My favourite, however, has to be the return of Batmite. When Bruce is taken over by the Zurinar personality, he starts hallucinating Batmite, who's meant to be a representation of his sanity, the last voice of reason. I just think this is a really cool way of explaining how all of this crazy shit from the 50s can exist in this far more dark and grounded era. Around the same time, Hush returns, and begins formulating a plan of revenge. Aware of Bruce's affection for Selina, Hush kidnaps her and removes her heart from her body, holding it hostage while she hangs on for dear life. Hush also tries to infiltrate Wayne Manor, disguised as Bruce himself, but Alfred sees right through him and kicks the shit out of him. Bruce, Dick and Tim join in on the action, leading to a climactic battle in the Batcave. Now, earlier I said that Batmite was my favourite returning aspect of the Silver Age, but I lied. It's actually the moment where Hush is fighting in the Batcave, he's got the upper hand, when all of a sudden he gets caught on the fucking whirly bat, which flies up into the cave ceiling and explodes Hush to death. I take back anything bad I ever said about it. Selina's heart is returned, and she's on her way to a full recovery. Visiting her in the hospital, Bruce monologues about how important she is to him, how she was the first person to break through to his heart, and that he does truly love her. This era is all about confronting the past. Hush, Jason, Damien, Zurinar, Batmite, KG Beast, the Whirly Bat. They're all there to make Bruce evaluate his own history, confront his old wounds and promises he made to himself and others. And so it makes sense that in this era's grand finale, Bruce must confront the one thing that started him on his journey. You see, everything culminates in Final Crisis, yet another big crossover event with Crisis in the title. Darkseid shows up, planning to take over all of reality or something. You know, he's always trying to do something like that. And so, to save the entire multiverse, Batman confronts Darkseid with a radiant bullet, one of the only things that can kill him. Bruce is now on the other side of the gun, he's crossing the line that defined him. And while he acknowledges this, the stakes are just too high, and he must make a painful exception. As noble as it may be, Bruce pays a price for crossing this line. Darkseid fires back his own deadly energy rays, completely burning Bruce to a crisp. Superman arrives to retrieve Bruce's body, but he's too late to save him. The Batman is dead. Bruce is mourned by those closest to him, especially Alfred, who was basically his father. Tim encourages Dick to take over as Batman again, and while Dick initially refuses, he eventually steps up and takes the mantle. Damien joins his side as Robin, with Alfred thinking that it'll be good for Damien, and it'll bring out the best in him. Meanwhile, Tim advances to the role of Red Robin. He is convinced that Bruce wasn't actually killed, but was instead sent back in time, and has been lost in the past ever since. No one really believes Tim at first, but as it turns out, he is 100% correct. Darkseid's blast managed to throw Bruce into the prehistoric era, with no memory of who he was. He was then sent forward across the timeline as a walking paradox, with Darkseid's evil, time-travelling beasts chasing him across multiple periods. Bruce adapts himself to these different eras, influencing Gotham's history while Tim and his allies try and track him down. Eventually, Bruce makes his way to the present day, although he's infected by the beast, and his mind is corrupted by Darkseid's design. His friends finally catch up with him, and Tim tries to remind him of who he is. To defeat Darkseid's influence over his mind, to reclaim his body as his own, Bruce must accept the first truth of Batman. What the hell does that mean, you ask? Well, Bruce started off fighting crime alone as a symbol of fear. Too often did he reject help from others, too often did he swear he would never have someone by his side again, and yet he was at his best when he had Robin, when he had Superman, when he learned to see the good in others, which in turn made him see the good in himself. If we go way back to year one, the very moment Bruce decided he would use the symbol of the bat, the very moment Batman was created, something interesting happens. As young Bruce lay bleeding out in Wayne Manor, having got his ass beat by criminals for the very first time, what did he do? He called Alfred. His first instinct was to call for help. Hell, if you go back even further, right back to the moment his parents are gunned down, he only makes it as far as he does because of those around him. And so the first truth of Batman, the one that liberates him from Darkseid's corruption, is that he's never been as alone as he thinks. It's literally the power of friendship, but told in a really beautiful way. When Bruce finally accepts this truth, he is purged of Darkseid. Now there is some stuff in between, but for the sake of both simplicity and consistency, Bruce Wayne is back. When Bruce returns to Gotham, he takes the first truth of Batman out into the world. He starts a global organisation called Batman Incorporated, spreading Batman's values and way of fighting crime all across the globe. You have Bruce as Batman, Dick as Batman, Damien as Robin, Tim as Red Robin, Barbara as Oracle. You have Stephanie, who actually faked her death and succeeded Cassandra as the new Batgirl. You have Lucius, who's designing a bunch of robots and cool shit for everyone to use. Also, you remember those Batman-inspired heroes from the 50s? Well, they're on the payroll too, operating in different countries around the world. It's all going really well, Bruce and Selina are working together, they're taking down bad guys, and then this fucking guy decides he likes his mother being alive. 
Barry Allen, aka The Flash, aka the fastest man alive, has run back in time, saving his mother from dying and in doing so creating an alternate timeline where everything's messed up. In this world, Bruce was killed instead of his parents, and his father, Thomas, became Batman instead. Barry's able to stop himself from changing the timeline and returns everything back to normal. Well, kind of. We'll get to that. But the story ends on a very bittersweet note. You see, when the alternate Thomas Wayne learned of a world in which his son was alive, he wrote Bruce a letter and asked Barry to deliver it once he'd restored the timeline. Upon receiving the letter, Bruce breaks down into tears and thanks Barry for passing on his father's final words. It's a very touching moment, but it's not without its complications. This Bruce isn't really the one we know, as the timeline wasn't put back together perfectly. Our hero's origins have been altered once more, and it's time for a new Batman, for fuck's sake. In 2011, the DC lineup was relaunched with the new 52, which implemented a bunch of changes in order to keep things fresh and say fuck you if you've been paying attention. In terms of Batman, everything's pretty much the same as usual, only it happens in a way more condensed time period. First we get Zero Year, a reimagining of Batman's first year in Gotham as he meets the Riddler, Catwoman, and an early version of the Joker. The Justice League is then formed to defeat Darkseid, Dick becomes Nightwing, Jason Todd becomes Robin, then becomes dead, Barbara is still paralysed by the Joker but in this universe she recovers thanks to a cybernetic implant and goes back to being Batgirl. Gordon's wife Sarah still dies, although he's still going strong in the old police department. Blah blah blah, Tim Drake, Broken Back, Red Hood, Damian Wayne, Batman Incorporated. This brings us to the start of the New 52, in which Batman is still relatively young and in his prime. During this time, Bruce meets new enemies such as the Court of Owls, a secret society who have controlled Gotham for hundreds of years. When Bruce attempts to take them on, he is broken down, beaten, but prevails nonetheless. One member of the court claims to be Thomas Wayne Jr., Bruce's long lost brother. While Bruce doesn't believe him, he doesn't have evidence to prove otherwise, and must live in uncertainty until he finds proof. By now, Dick has gone back to being Nightwing, leaving Damien in the hands of his father. Bruce starts homeschooling him, and tries to put his brutal tendencies to rest. Still, Bruce isn't the best at getting through to his son, and has to receive advice from Alfred on how to parent properly. Despite Bruce's wishes, Damien continues killing their enemies. Instead of freaking out, however, and firing Damien from the role, Bruce gives him another chance. He acknowledges that while he may not understand his son, he still cares for him deeply, and wants him to be the best person he can. It is really sweet just seeing Bruce make an effort, you know, trying to spend time with Damien not just as Batman, but as his dad. Bruce's love for his family is threatened, however, when the Joker returns, crazier than ever. Having taken off his own face and then stitched it back on, Joker unveils a new plan to make Batman's life hell. Having apparently deduced everyone's identities, he tortures Alfred, he traumatises Gordon, and kidnaps the entire Bat family. The thing is though, Joker thrives in uncertainty. He himself doesn't know his own backstory, and he wants to keep it that way. And so, when Batman claims to have figured out the Joker's identity and threatens to tell him, the Joker would rather die than ruin the mystery for himself. Meanwhile, Bruce has also been running Batman Incorporated, taking on Talia and her criminal organisation Leviathan. He does this with the help of a couple new recruits. First you have Jason, who's been offered a second chance, and joins Batman Incorporated as the crime fighter Wingman. Then, during a raid against Leviathan, Damien rescues a cow from a slaughterhouse, aptly naming her Bat-Cow. Bat-Cow is taken into the Bat-Cave and becomes a vital member of the team. During the war against Talia, Bruce is kidnapped by one of her warriors, the Heretic, who just so happens to be an adult clone of Damien, because why not? Upon hearing this, Damien rushes in to try and save his dad, battling the Heretic all by himself. While Damien makes a noble attempt, the whole thing's ultimately in vain, and he is fatally wounded. The team is crushed by Damien's demise, none more so than Bruce himself. While mourning in the Batcave, Bruce has a touching moment with Batcow, remembering how Damien brought her in and gave her a second chance. Bat-cow, he says, to which Bat-cow replies, Moo. Okay, it's actually a really sad moment, but it's just so ridiculous out of context. Shortly after, Bruce and Selina save the entire world together, although they still, for some reason, can't be in a relationship. Then, Bruce's totally real brother returns, fucks everything up, like a whole bunch, only to be defeated by the power of friendship. Now we all know that no one stays dead in comics for long, and so when Bruce hears of an opportunity to resurrect Damien, he jumps at the chance. You see, Damien's body has ended up in the hands of Darkseid's son, and is being used to power a giant space weapon. Bruce will let nothing stand between him and his son, and so he deploys the Hellbat, a special suit of armour forged by the Justice League which will allow him to enter Darkseid's domain. Bruce charges in, even taking on Darkseid himself, before successfully retrieving Damien's body and bringing him home. Bruce uses a special Chaos Crystal, infused with Darkseid's energy, and before you know it, Batman has his son back. Okay, so after all that, we get a chance to breathe, to dwell on the happy moment. And then all of a sudden, the Joker is back. 
In classic Joker fashion, he creates a pathogen which spreads throughout the city, turning everyone insane. He then uses this to control the Justice League, and as a cherry on top, he makes sure that patient zero of the virus is Joe Chill. Also, he chops off Alfred's hand. To develop the antidote, Batman receives help from Crazy Quilt of all people, who, despite being ridiculous, is actually very scientifically gifted. You see, Crazy Quilt has discovered a rare substance called Dionysium, capable of healing tissue and even bringing back people from the dead. It's the same sort of stuff that's in Lazarus Pits, and the Joker's been using it to heal himself, restore his face, etc. And so if Batman can find wherever Joker's getting this Dionysium, he'll be able to synthesize a cure and save the whole city. Batman locates the source deep underground, and retrieves a sample, but not before he's confronted by the Joker. During their battle, the pool of Dionysium is destroyed, and both men are left gravely injured. This leaves Bruce with a choice. He can either open his sample of Dionysium, the last piece left, and use it to heal himself, or he can send the sample up to the surface, where it will have no risk of being contaminated and be made into the cure. For a guy like Batman, it's a no-brainer. And so he chooses to bleed out at the sight of his greatest rival, while the city he loves, the city he's fought for all his life, lives on. And that's the entire history of Batman. Nah, I'm just kidding. He stays dead for about 20 pages and then shows up alive with no memories of Batman or anything really. It turns out that during the fight with the Joker, he was actually exposed to Dionysium, which healed him, great, but it also rewrote his brain, his experiences. Of course, the city still needs the Batman in Bruce's absence, and so Commissioner Gordon rises to the challenge, going through his own intense training, combined with his intimate knowledge of the city, to take his friend's place. Alfred insists to everyone else that they don't tell Bruce about Batman, and instead let him live a normal life where he can finally rest. Although he soon finds out that this isn't possible. Batman is inevitable, and when Gotham needs his help, he'll always find a way back. Using a backup of all his memories, Bruce returns as Batman for the millionth time, and thanks Gordon for stepping up in his absence. By now, the new 52 is wrapping up, and it kinda goes out with a bang. Batman uses a giant bat megazord to fight a giant plant monster, and if that wasn't extreme enough, he then becomes the god of all knowledge. Next, we get DC Rebirth, which restores a lot of the pre-Flashpoint stuff while still celebrating the New 52 in an attempt to harmonise both continuities. Some origin stories are revised but never changed entirely. We get glimpses into the past, we get Kite Man, hell yeah, and we more or less pick up where we left off. Bruce fights classic villains such as Hugo Strange, Solomon Grundy, and Bane. He starts a new team called the Gotham Knights, featuring Tim, Stephanie, Cassandra, Jean-Paul, Lucius' son Lucas as Batwing, Kate Kane as Batwoman, and even Clayface, who's given up on crime and is now fighting on the side of the angels. Also, Bruce gets closer to Selina. Things are looking very promising, and can it please just, just please work out this time? Eventually, we get a story in which both Bruce and Barry manage to travel to the Flashpoint timeline, the one where Barry fucks everything up. In doing so, Bruce comes face to face with the alternate version of his father, leading to an emotional conversation between them. Bruce thanks his dad for the letter, saying it was the greatest gift anyone's ever given him. He tells Thomas of his own son, Damien, and begs his dad to come with him, back to the normal timeline where he can show his dad all that he's accomplished, the life he's built for himself. Thomas, however, refuses to leave. He's lived his life, he doesn't want to mess up this other world, and is more than happy with the knowledge that Bruce will live on somewhere else in time. Before Bruce disappears, Thomas tells him to stop being Batman, to instead focus on being a father to Damien and seek a life of happiness. And while Bruce can never give up Batman completely, he does somewhat take Thomas's advice. After saving the multiverse again, and fighting this fucking thing, Bruce takes a serious step towards happiness. On a dark rooftop in the middle of a thunderstorm, Bruce proposes to Selina, having bought the diamond she stole when they first met and turned it into a ring. And thank god, she says yes. Bruce and Selina go on double dates with Clark and Lois. Talia tries to kill Selina with a fucking sword. Then the Joker hears about the wedding and tries to ruin everything, but they stop him and everything's fine. Finally, it's time for the wedding and everyone's getting ready and they're excited and they've got a drunk guy to officiate the wedding because he's so much of an alcoholic that he'll forget their identities straight after. But that's fine because this is the moment people have been waiting for since 1940 and Alfred's taking him to the wedding and Selina doesn't show up to the wedding and wait- No! No! Okay, so it turns out that Selina was being manipulated by Bane to convince her that the marriage was a bad idea and this was all part of his plan to ruin Batman's life. And you know what? He's not even done there. You think it would be enough to break his heart, to turn him cold, to make him so rash that his closest allies turn against him? But no, Bane's really gonna one-up himself this time. First he gets Scarecrow to mess with Bruce's head, trapping him in an endless nightmare. Then, as another way of psychologically messing with Bruce, Bane teams up with the alternate Thomas Wayne, who has made his way to the main timeline after the Flashpoint 1 collapsed. And as surprising as it is, both Bane and Thomas share the same goal. They want to stop Bruce from being Batman, despite having radically different reasons for it. 
In his own fucked up way, Thomas believes he's doing what's best for his son, and has no problem emotionally breaking Bruce if it means he'll give up crime fighting. After Bane beats the absolute shit out of him, Bruce is taken into the desert by Thomas, who assures him that he's beaten and there's nothing he can do. Thomas wants to use a Lazarus pit to resurrect Bruce's mother, and that way they can live as one big happy family and have a nice life without Batman. When Bruce objects to this and tries to ruin Thomas's plan, Bruce is beaten once more and is abandoned in the wilderness to rot. Meanwhile in Gotham, Bane's doing his usual, freeing all the villains, plunging the city into chaos, while Batman's allies are overwhelmed. However, there's a key difference this time. Bane has taken Alfred hostage, and if anyone tries to mess with his plan, if one of Batman's allies step out of line, Alfred's getting it. Damien being the quick-tempered little warrior that he is, calls Bane's bluff, because hey, they're not really going to kill off Alfred, are they? In response to Damien's attack, Bane has Thomas beat him senseless. He then drags Damien into a dark room, ties him up, and snaps Alfred's neck in front of him. As Alfred's lifeless body is left in the chair opposite Damien, Bane now has a new hostage, and if anyone tries to ruin his plan again, Damien will pay. Meanwhile, Bruce is rescued from the middle of nowhere by Catwoman, who's very sorry for leaving him at the altar and is going to make up for it by saving his life. She nurses Bruce back to health, and as soon as he's on the mend, the two return to Gotham to confront Bane. Bruce and Selina start small, working with Clayface to take down the freed villains, before working their way up to Bane himself. Bane wishes to fight Bruce one on one, but Bruce, having accepted the first truth of Batman, says fuck that, and takes all the help he can get. With Bane out of the picture, all that leaves is Thomas Wayne, who is still determined to stop his son from being Batman. Now Thomas really goes the extra mile. He shows Bruce Alfred's corpse. He says, look what you did, don't you see why you should give up Batman? Don't you see that I'm just trying to do what's best for you? And while Bruce is completely destroyed by what's happened to Alfred, his grief only empowers him to keep going. He fights Thomas in the name of his real father, the one who really knew what was best for him, and in the end, emerges victorious. After it's all over, Bruce continues being Batman, although the wound left by Alfred's demise is not one which will heal quickly. Bruce has these moments where he'll forget Alfred's not on the other side of the communicator, and he's forced to remind himself that the man who raised him is no longer around. Now, as of September 2023, Alfred is still officially dead. They are really committing to it for the time being. But who are they kidding? Of course they're going to bring him back at some point. Bruce's loved ones are going to keep dying and being resurrected. The Joker is always going to show up with one last master plan. Bane's always going to show up to break him one last time. The universe will eventually be rebooted again and again, sending him back to square one. This pain will never end, and that's kind of the point. Batman is motivated by an unquenchable thirst for vengeance. He's stuck in a never-ending battle against fear and death, and that's the life he's chosen for himself. That's what being Batman is. And so, to live a life like that, to endure every day knowing that it'll never stop, you kind of need to let yourself be happy. You have to be able to confront the past, you have to embrace those around you and take help where you can get it. Batman's story is one of redemption, it's one of facing the truth, and sometimes, just sometimes, it's about hope and happiness. And on that note, I finally finished this fucking video! Okay, I haven't read the recent shit, okay, I, I don't want to know what Gotham War is, so yeah, I'm gonna leave it here. Now, if you like this format, you can check out my other videos and like, subscribe, all that shite. But if you want more Batman, I would highly, highly recommend my good friend Sal, who's helped me out a ton in making this video. Not only are his videos incredibly well made and in depth, but he's also just an insanely nice guy. He's been making videos for the past six-ish years, and it's criminal how underrated he is, relative to all the effort he's put in. Alright, that'll do for today. Uh, make sure to keep KG Beasts in your prayers, and uh, I'm gonna go collapse now. Peace.